look at it from our church perspective, one of the problems we have because of the, the, uh, okay, because of the, the other issues that we have in the church, especially the, the Muslim invasion and the occupation of most of the Orthodox places, but Orthodox church had suffered a lot. And if we don't take this into account, we will understand the circumstances we're in. For example, the, uh, the highest, uh, the biggest place for orthodoxy in the first era after the apostolic time was the Byzantine church. Constantine established Constantinople and then that was the center for Christianity then. And then you have Egypt. Remember, I te we teach this in, in Sunday school that there are five churches in the beginning after the apostolic time. Jerusalem was the first, Antioch was the second, uh, Rome was the third, then when Rome shifted by Constantine to uh, Constantinople, become Byzantium, Alexandria was in between, immediately after Rome. So you have those five churches, but Constantinople, Antioch, and Alexandria were occupied by the Arab invasion for the longest time, from the sixth century all the way to, to today. Uh, Rome continued untouched, it was defended, uh, good. And Jerusalem, of course, you know, same again, it's under the Arab. So the, the Islam took over all the Eastern Christian world and it dictated what happens there. And uh, that happened immediately after the split of the church. It gives no space for us to kind of relax and do all the studies and the work, the leg work to gather our personality and identity. So when I say that we don't have a stand on certain issues, this is a byproduct of that. We, we were the most active church in evangelization. We couldn't anymore. So we had to kind of shrink and just defend our identity. So I'm going to talk about the trials and efforts made by different personalities in the Orthodox world. Might be from Russia, might be from U the United States. There's actually one of the best works I've come across uh, by a professor, I think he's in Houston, his name is Engelhardt on bioethics. A very beautiful work. If you can have a chance, get uh, your hand on, on a copy of this book. It's called uh, uh, Engelhardt. I f I, his first name is difficult, so I, it's a little bit. So the, the book is called Found The Foundation of Bioethics. It's, uh, the, he made the second edition. Very uh, praiseworthy. So when you look at our stand on, um, on issues of life and moral decision making, we always start with the Bible as the foundational roots and grounds for our decision making. And there are just examples. I'm not saying that we, we are going to cover everything. I'm just gonna give you examples from different places the church hold on to. One is that God is the author of all life and, it's, and God is the sustainer of all forms of life. <clears throat> we call God in the Orthodox Church Pantocrator. The Western Church call him Almighty. Pantocrator is different than Almighty. In the Greek terminology, it's a word you cannot translate. Because if you want to translate that word, it will come up with a big load of vocabulary. So what's Pantocrator? Any idea? the hold, the one that holds all, which includes sustain, protect, feed, heal, uh, look after, all these meanings. The difference between this and Almighty is, the Almighty is a little potential, like uh, he can do anything, but it doesn't mean that he's actively doing it. Um, in Genesis 1, the account of Genesis 1 tells us, uh, you, in any way you, Look at Genesis 1, if you are supporting evolution, you're not supporting evolution, that God is the cause of all life. And by Jewish uh, explanations and Christian explanations across the age is that God is the origin of all life and he is the one to sustain it. In the book of Acts, <clears throat> St. Paul is talking to Athenians, big people in philosophy. He said that one of their philosophers actually, St. Paul read to that philosopher said, he said, the philosopher said, in him, in God, we live and move 
and have our being. So even the old world thought of God as a source of, although they didn't know him, but the philosophers got that, and that the, the sustainer of life and the origin of life is God. In our creed, we say, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. So we have this perfect uh, certainty that God, the Trinity, is the source and the sustainer of our life. We, we, in the prayer, we call the, the Spirit, O Prince of Life and King of the Ages. I'm sorry, that's sincere liturgy uh, to the Father. At the beginning of the, the sincere liturgy, we say, O Prince of Life, that's, a, that's addressed to the Father. And then in the third hour, we say, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Creator of Goodness, and the Giver of Life. We keep praying to God, the source of all life. And we acknowledge that in almost every day prayer. God is the author of life. He never wants us to die for any reason. Rather, he wants all of us to live. Our personal ethical task is to receive the cross and the resurrection with thanksgiving and not to curse the grace he gives us because of the cross he asked us to bear. Um, this is from an article by Orthodox website on the sacredness of life. Um, and that is referring to a verse uh, from Ezekiel. For I have no pleasure in the death of one who's, who dies, says the Lord God, therefore turn and live. God is not pleased with us dying. If we died, it was our choice. And death which entered into the world through the envy of the devil, you have abolished. He wanted to rescue us from that. So God is all about life. <clears throat> there are commandments that actually protect life, like God said, we should not do. And the, the Bible is very clear about them. The first time the commandment not to kill comes not in the Ten Commandments. It was actually to Noah. When, when Noah comes out from the ark after the flood, the story t tell us about a commandment to eat flesh. For the first time, God is giving a commandment to eat something other than vegan. So he uh, told Noah and his family and his descendants, you can eat flesh, but be careful not to eat blood. And that's very significant. He said, the life of the animal is in its blood. So don't be so, uh, what's the word, perverse or uh, lustful or desirous that you ignore their sanctity here. The blood is, is, is holy. Don't use it just to satisfy your hunger or because it tastes good to you. That, that's very perverse. So he said, not to eat blood because um, I will, because he said uh, it, it is part of the, or it is the reason of the uh, life of the flesh, um, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That's equal, the, the Bible and the Jews understood this. The life of the body is in the blood. When I, I say this, I explain it simply. If you cut a nerve from an arm, it continues to live. You cut a muscle, it continues to live. You break the bone, it continues to live. But you cut the artery, it's dead. So the life of that organ is in the life, or in the blood supply. <coughs> uh, and it also represents the blood of the, the humans. But then he goes to say, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. So there is a very strong commandment in Genesis, still in the first few chapters. On the, in the beginning of the earth about killing. When you talk about, and of course you have, I don't know if the, that slide was misplaced. There is a, uh, the, the commandment number seven, which says thou shall not kill. And they say in the Hebrew translation, it means you should never kill, never. That's how it, the Hebrew word is translated literally. Commandment that safeguard life, uh, we have the, the, the ethical code in our orthodox thinking. What is the characteristics? How do you define the ethical code? What are the conditions? It definitely should be biblical. And the second word, I hope we, uh, we get this word, it's soteriological from sotir means saving, salvation. So it should aim, the ethics should aim to save people. 
It is not just to protect life. It has faith. It cannot be without faith. And we're going to see why this is important. And it is relational. It's viewed in relation to God and to the church community. That includes what, the, what we do in the church, in liturgy, canons, patrology, etc. So you have those four characteristics. It's biblical, uh, rela related to salvation. It is related to faith, and it is relational. You cannot wrench it out of the church. That's the second one that was misplaced. You, thou shalt not kill from the Ten Commandments, and then Christ actually brings this even to a higher level in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you have heard that was said to the, those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So what did Christ do? He actually made a very big distance between physical murder and the Christian. So it was like a fine line. I can do whatever I do. I hit, I hurt, I uh, take an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I should not kill. But then he, what he's doing here is let's give, give a space, very big space between the two. That even made that commandment very uh, strict. What did the church fathers say? Tertullian, who died around 240, described how Christians thought about abortion in this way. For us, we may not destroy even the fetus in the womb. While as yet the human being drives blood from other parts of the body for its sustenance, to hinder a birth is merely a speedier man killing. Nor does it matter when you take away a life that is born or destroy one that is coming to birth. That is a man which is going to be one. You have the fruit already in the seed. The second century Athenagoras, a philosopher and a convert to the Christianity addressed charges about, uh, people used to talk about Christians as cannibalists. He thought they were eating babies in the church. So he, in defense, he said, <coughs> part of that, it's a big defense, but this is a very small part in the middle. What reason would we have to commit murder when we say that women who induce abortion are murderers will have to give account of it to God? So the same person would not regard the fetus in the womb as a living thing, <coughs> and therefore an object of God's care and at the same time slay it. Once it had come to life uh, after, after the birth, nor would he refuse to leave infants out in the woods to die on the ground that those who expose them are murderers of children. And at the same time, do away with the child as he has reared. But we are altogether consistent in our conduct. We obey reason and do not override it. He says that it doesn't matter if he's born, the baby is born, or it's still in the womb of, uh, of its mother. In the fourth century, St. Basil the Great addressed those who wanted to draw <coughs> an arbitrary line concerning the beginning of human life by saying, the woman who purposely destroys her unborn child is guilty of murder. The hair splitting, there used to be that debate in his time. Uh, the baby is formed or not formed? <coughs> They said if you make uh, uh, the proof that the baby is unformed, you can, you can destroy it. If it is formed, you don't destroy it. That debate still today. We know that the difference definition of uh, a human being is, is, uh, is, is different from one country in Europe, for example, and then the other. Some countries in Europe says uh, the, ma the human being is not formed until the third, the, the third trimester. And they say, some, some countries say he's not a human until the second trimester. And some say he's not a human until he's born. And every country would, would legalize abortion based on that definition. Some say uh, he's not a human being until they leave home. They, uh, they would see as it comes out. So if it's like how many months passed, they make, an, uh, they make a debate, so they say, okay, it's four, four weeks, it's six weeks, it's a month, it's two months. That's, that's the debate, it's not new. So it's not new, they say, okay, we'll legalize second trimester abortions, but not the third trimester. So based on what? The, the basis of it is that they don't consider the second trimester baby a human being. <coughs> 
I wanted to, I missed, there's a slide here with an icon um, in a Byzantine right, there's an icon of the visitation. When St. Mary goes to visit St. Elizabeth, I don't know if you saw this move, uh, icon. There is uh, the, the, the womb of both of the women has infants in them. And the infant in the womb, the womb of St. Elizabeth is kneeling, bowing down to the infant in the womb of St. or the baby, the, the embryo in the womb of St. But how old was the embryo in the womb of St. Mary? <coughs> hmm? Yeah, it would be days by maximum. Days. And that bending down, that kneeling is given to him as a full being in the womb of St. Mary. And then I also, St. Elizabeth addressed her as the mother of my Lord. She's already the mother of my Lord. That's very significant. And on, based on this, the church looks at it and said, says, that's it. There is no need for further uh, debate over this. The, 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 the baby in the womb, St. Mary, as days is considered the Lord. Full human being. <coughs> in the mysteries of the church, the Eucharist is at the heart of the church life. The purpose of all the mysteries is to develop the life of God in the human being. So the, the church doesn't see separations. Like here is uh, physical development. Here is spiritual development. Here is mental development. Here is emotion. No, we don't do that. It's a continuum. So there is a continuum of development from conception to eternity. This is one human being that goes through the development and they are all equal. There is no one stage more important than the other. And that's why the mysteries is to in, in, in infuse, to give to the baby that was formed in the womb, the divine life. In the Greek world, they like a word, we don't use it much, but theosis. So we, we can say to be partners like St. Peter, partners in the divine nature. And, and you cannot give partnership to divine nature to animals. It is to full-blown humans. Um, move forward to, to, to parts of this book I told you about, which I, uh, I, uh, I liked a lot. <coughs> the beginning of the introduction of this book, the foundation of bioethics, talks about the, the reality of moral diversity. He said, today, we have to realize that there is actually more than, more, more than one moral code. People are not agreeable on what is good and what's evil. You can't agree. And the, 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 the difference is when you go deeper into the, or you go closer into the debates, you'd find it's much deeper than we think. Much, much deeper. What people consider good and evil is a very different sides. <clears throat> Moral diversity is a product of postmodernism. What is postmodernism? Um, I, I hope you're familiar with these terms. So we live in that time, postmodernism, the breakdown of all kinds of belief systems. Um, it was actually the, the, the writer is an Orthodox uh, teacher in, in the university, and he writes and he, he gives you the, his beliefs from the beginning. He says, it was Western theology that developed the status we're in. And this is important to understand. How, how so? How did the Roman Catholic Church prepare humanity in the West to this? He said, very simple. When they adopted the Greek and Roman philosophies about the in intellect, they said, intellect can grasp all realities away from the supernatural old believing. I can, I can understand things and I can grasp things where I don't have to believe in anything that's unseen. What do you call that? Rationalism. To rationalize everything and to understand everything. So when they did that, you have somebody like uh, Anselm, a bishop from, I think, England, before the, the split. And you have, of course, parts of Thomas Aquinas, where he did the, what we call the, he, he is the one who established the, started the systematic theology. That theology can be understood in steps, like you get from point A 
to point B to point C and you keep developing. So it's all rationalizing. He said we can understand right from wrong from thinking about it. And then he, the, you know, the hypothesis was that everybody, once you get to, into this rationalization, everybody would agree on it. Because you don't require them to believe. So if we can get uh, a mental image of the truth, it will be one truth. Okay, but that was based on that the whole world at that time was Christian. They forgot that. As faith the, the, the collapsed, faith collapsed, but this idea didn't collapse. That we can grasp the universal truth by just thinking. There is, yes. Yes, when we, I think Augustine said a nice thing, but I don't know how did this slip away. Augustine said, I believe, therefore I study. The concept we have today is, I study, I don't need to believe. So you, we start from point of revelation, what God had revealed to us, and then we examine things based on that revelation. Like I just told you, uh, St. Mary goes to visit St. Elizabeth, and there was a, uh, a beckoning. There was uh, the, the the child was like moving violently even in her uh, womb, and then the church said, uh, "This is uh, the uh, full humanity of Christ in his few days." <coughs> then I can base everything after that on that. Just this becomes a fact. But when the church says, "We let's put aside this as a revelation. You don't have to believe in it. Let's start thinking about it mentally. How the how we can reach the same reach the same result by." Just thinking about it. That goes back to Greek and Roman philosophies, where they didn't have anything to hang on to. So this is the problem. This is where we have, remember what I said in the characteristics? What is it, part of it? Faith is foundational. It is at the basis. You cannot start without it. If we leave faith out, then we're going to end up by this rationalism and the breaking down of the moral code. There's few resources that I put here. There is a nice movie that I, I, would, I wish that you can all watch if you can get a chance. It's called After the Truth. It's a movie. It's a, it's a, it's a fiction, but it's built around this famous Nazi doctor, the Dr. Mengele. He was, it's called The Age of Death. I hope you can see this movie. It's really good. About how people rationalize their actions. And they give it all kinds of reason. This guy, uh, they bring him back after his old age to try him. And he is getting a lawyer. And the lawyer is trying to get him out. Uh, it's, really, it's really a nice one. So the, the, this is one. That's the book, the second one, The Foundation of Bioethics by Ish Tristram. It's, his name is Tristram Engelhardt. There's an article by a very famous um, uh, ethics teacher. He was the dean of the Holy Cross Seminary in, uh, in, uh, in Boston, Dr. Uh, Father Harakas. He, is, uh, he was a teacher and also in uh, St. Vladimir. Just a few, few resources. I know you don't have that much time, but if you can get a decent look into them, that would be wonderful. In that book, he talks about uh, terminologies of moral friends and moral strangers. And also, what happens when you have moral friends in the communities and moral strangers in the communities and also in societies? What's the difference between communities and societies? Community is like a church. We are here in a community. Usually it's some minority or a group of people that have the same moral code. And it's usually a religious institution. Because what makes a moral code is the presence of God. You cannot have moral code without supreme authority. It's very difficult to have that. You cannot force somebody, you know, uh, unless you, 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 make, you make it through force. I make my moral code by force like the mafia, right? 
The mafia did their moral code. They have a moral code to live by. And if somebody doesn't follow, what happens? It's gone. So this is the only thing that ha now is acceptable is to have that reason. And most probably would not be acceptable too long. The, uh, in the communities, you can have moral strangers. For example, we might not agree in the church on the details of how we do things, but eventually we're going to go and ascend to a higher moral code that we all agree to. So we can resolve the issue almost perfectly if we, if we, if we really tot totally committed to the community. But in society, you can do that. You can have moral strangers. Do you understand? Let me define moral strangers, people who does not agree on the same moral values, but they would go and conflict. Um, there is, in the book he says, there is still a shred of hope that we can come to a moral code that everybody can agree on. Because now we can understand each other. A Jew can understand the traditional Muslim. They may not agree with them, but now because of all this flood of information, they can understand how they think. And they can try to help to reach a, a certain code that they all can live with. But it's going to be very difficult, and it's a big struggle. And that's why all the bioethics studies in this. And he said one of the things that's happening, ethics as a science, is not doing too well. Because they're trying to deal with a lot of directions. They're trying to pull everything together, and it's very difficult. Um, the hunger for uh, genesis and justification of unified moral code can only be found in God. That's from the book. I would like to kind of finish today with this uh, interesting thing, because I think when I was in medicine, we had to do it. Uh, that says how old I am. It's the Hippocratic Oath. I don't know if you are still required to do it. Are you? In graduation, you do it? OK, that's nice. This is a Byzantine copy from the 12th century uh, that has the Hippocratic Oath as a, in the shape of the cross. So this is the Christian copy of it. That's a manuscript from the Vatican, from the Vatican Library. Um, th so that tells you that in that time they used to adopt it. That's, uh, that's how it goes, I swear by Apollo. That's the original one. <laughs> the deity has to be in that. <laughs> Apollo and the healer, uh, Asclepius, Hagia, and Panacea, and I take the witness of all the gods, all the goddesses, to keep according to my ability and my judgment the following oath and agreement. To consider dear to me as my parents, him who taught me. The first part is about the teacher. They're actually very loyal to the teacher. And not that to taught uh, his, uh, his art, to live in common with him, and if necessary to share my goods with him, to look upon his children as my own brothers, to teach them this art, and that by my teaching I will impart the knowledge of this art to my own sons, and to my teacher's sons, and to the disciples bound by an indenture and oath according to the medical laws and no other. Uh, he would not give it to outsiders. So this is a, a commitment uh, to teach. This is part of that, and his uh, uh, fidelity to the teacher. I will prescribe regimens for the good of my patients according to my ability and my judgment and never do harm to anyone. I remember when it was a residency, my teacher used to recite that to me. Do no harm, do no harm. And it was like imprinted like with fire. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked. If asked, nor suggest any such counsel. And similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. That's usually the mode of abortion at the time. Uh, but I will preserve the purity of my life and my art. I will not cut for stone. That's a surgery. They, they used to diagnose stones. And <laughs> the way to get the stone out is to cut the person. But uh, this is apparently an internist, <laughs> an author <laughs> internist. <laughs> uh, yes, because what says. Uh, <laughs> I will not cut for stone even for patients in whom the disease is manifest. I will leave this operation to be performed by practitioners, specialists in this art. <laughs> okay. In every house where I come, I will enter only for the good of my patients, keeping myself far from all intentional ill-doing and all seduction, and especially from the pleasures of love with women or men, be they free or slaves. 
all that may come to my knowledge in the exercise of my profession or in daily commerce with men which ought not to be spread abroad I would keep secret and I would never reveal if I keep this oath faithfully may I enjoy my life and practice my art respected by all humanity and in all time but if I swerve from it by or violate it may the reverse be my life very good isn't it yeah now we have they have changed it the new times has changed that oath it became different but it still until recently included that part about death about preservation of life the oath has been modified multiple times one of the most significant revisions was first drafted in 1948 by the world medical association called the declaration of geneva it was intended to be a self-conscious rewriting of the hippocratic oath reaffirming hippocratism in the face of the shame and tragedy of the German medical experience. The Third Reich said that there were, was life not worth living, and this was seen in their medical experiment. That, that renewed the interest in the Hippocratic Oath. 1960s, the Hippocratic Oath was changed to utmost respect for human life from its beginning. This is the 60s talking. Uh, making it a more secular concept, it has nothing to do with a God. It's not to be taken in the presence of God or any gods, but before only other people. While there is currently no legal obligation for medical students to swear an oath upon graduating, 98% of American medical students swear some form of oath, while only 50% of British medical students do. In 1989 survey of 126 uh, medical schools, only three reported usage of the original oath, while 33 used the Declaration of Geneva, 67 used the modified Hippocratic Oath, or used, uh, four used the oath of uh, Maimonides, that's a Hebrew uh, uh, rabbi who uh, had a lot to do with ethics. One used the covenant, e eight used another oath, one used an unknown oath, and two did not use any kind of oath. Seven medical schools did not reply to the survey in France. It is common for new medical graduates to sign a written oath. In the United States, the majority of osteopathic medical schools use the osteopathic oath as well as the Hippocratic oath. They do two of them. The Osteopathic Oath was first used in 1938, and the current version has been used since 1954. Despite the old Hippocratic Oath prohibiting abortion, it is no longer considered a professional violation of ethics to perform, perform one in the United States. I'm done with that, but uh, what do you notice? Well, there is a lot of shifting happening. People had a uniform, uniform consensus uh, about preservation of life, but today we were debating it very hard, and it seems like uh, the, the, the battle is lost. I have, uh, I don't know, who, anybody else preparing stuff on bioethics today? You know? Okay, all right. So I, if, you, if you have any questions, I can share with you a couple of situations, but then other than that, you can, you can ask questions if you want. You want that? Okay. I remember that day where you had. Uh, I had. I was in the second, year, first year or second year. I was in the intensive care, and there was this uh, Jewish old lady. She was in her 90s, and she had uh, end-stage COPD. She was borderline CO2, CO2 retention, but she signed already DNR. She doesn't want any kind of intervention. She came with, uh, she had osteoporosis, came with uh, uh, vertebral, neck vertebra fracture. And she was in severe pain. I could hear her screaming. It, it was intolerable uh, from, you know, uh, the next word. The, her, her attending physician didn't think he can give her anything because they give her uh, all kinds of pain medicine and we're left only with morphine. That's it. There's nothing else to do. But you know morphine will kill her. Um, and then the, uh, the screaming was on for three days. She doesn't sleep. She doesn't eat. She doesn't do anything but scream, 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 scream. Then I, I, I couldn't take it. It was too much. No one in severe agony. Um, and then the nurses asked, what should we do? We called the attending physician. The attending physician doesn't want to respond anymore. He doesn't want to answer. So what would you do? 
the tiny old, old lady who doesn't know. She maybe weighs at maximum 80 pounds. So I told him, uh, usually to give, you give his start with like three milligrams of morphine, two maybe, but I told him give her one, see what happens. She got one milligram, and then two hours later she died. So I felt so guilty about it, but then I went and I talked to my father of confession. I told him, you know, I don't know what, ha what happened. And am I responsible, not responsible? It's like a very gray area. I don't know what, what, what how, can I how should I feel about this? And he told me, no, you didn't mean bad. You didn't mean evil. He was not in the medical field. He was not an ethics major. He doesn't have anything to do with this. But he gave me the right answer because I looked up and I had to do a big study on what's right and wrong. And I found out the giving of medicine uh, pain medicine especially, in a situation like this especially, specifically, uh, the ethics people ad agreed from a point of view, it is the intention of the doctor that makes the difference. If the intention is to kill the person as a mercy killing, then it is criminal. If the intention is to alleviate the pain, not, not foreseeing what will happen, then it is agreeable that it is not a problem. This is in church people. The so Catholic Church especially had d done a lot of studies on this. So to alleviate pain at the end of life, even with the risk of dying, is an acceptable procedure. Um, now you come to the question of something like this. So what do you do with um, a girl who is raped? That's a common question. And she's pregnant. How we deal with that, and how do you think about it? There is definitely a chaos coming from what we call, uh, we're gonna read this in the book too. They call it the intuitory, the, the intuition about right and wrong. In ethics that doesn't work, intuitions doesn't work. There's nothing like that in right and wrong. How do you go about that? How do you think about it? So if you give yourself the, you give a chance to your feelings, what would your feelings say? You feel bad for the girl, but you don't feel bad for the baby. But then you go to basics of ethics, the baby is a full blown human being. So you want to compare this, is, it's an evil situation. You have two evils here. You have two evils. You wanna kill the baby and destroy his life or her life to save the morale of the girl and maybe save her future. We don't know. But if you think about from the ethical point of view, you know, uh, far away from our emotions and our intuition, of course, killing someone is adding more problem to the situation itself. She can give the baby for adoption, she's already pregnant, she's already a mother. That fact is established. She can give him for adoption, she can do other things. But we don't think about ethics. This is a, this is a very important guideline for me. I don't think about ethics with my emotions. That's the church ethics. Because life, the church has a, a motto that I think I didn't write, but it says, the value of life or the dignity of life is in life itself. If somebody say, okay, an, a terminal person who is going to uh, lose his memory, um, he pees in, uh, on himself and he has a lot of issues. He has lost any kind of quality of life. Then they say, it is out of dignity we should put him to sleep if we can use the, borrow the terminology. No, no, because his life as is, is valuable. Because it's sustained and maintained by God and, and made by God. No, so that means if I'm not doing well in society, wait until I'm asleep and kill me, if that's the case. And that movie, we will tell you that. Where is we, where we draw the line? Who can say, play the rule of God and say, 
this is actually the line where we can say this life is worth it and this life is not worth it. We make ourselves gods. And where, where is that coming from? Like I told you, there's a lot of stuff that makes this a problem. Can anybody tell me what factors, what factors push society today to think of the human life as not as valuable as it should think? What factors? One of the factors is the belief in evolution. Because if God, if, if God did not create the man, and the man is not created in the image of God, and he has any significance in his own existence, even with, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Alzheimer and uh, loss of control and all kinds of things, without, then he can be killed, like putting a dog to sleep. I remember uh, uh, they put dogs to sleep for different reasons. They, nobody cares about, you know, what reason you give. You, you, some people say, if I want to move from my house to go to the city and I'm going to live in an apartment they allow no pets, then what am I going to do with my dog? I feel like very harsh to put him in a shelter. That's not what I want for my dog. Let's put him to sleep. So, but what, what moved this is the value of human being had been, which is contrary to what everybody thinks. They think that we live in an age where the value of humans are up. It is not nor the value of women. The more the people fight about the, the women's rights, the actually the more you see the society is bring it down. You can look at how much pornography is horrible. Like it's out of control. What kind of value we give to women? Nothing. So this is a result of this, uh, of, of this ideology that is adopted now. More and more people believe in, the more and more people believe in evolution as the the explanation of life, the more you see their views on euthanasia and abortion is uh, skewed. It's going in that direction. In that situation, well, I, when I when I have this and I had it as a priest, that the uh, the the girl made a decision to do an abortion. Now, one thing we didn't talk about is important that we brought this abortion in the church except for emergencies, when there's a risk of the life of the woman, the therapeutic abortion, it's uh, canonized for a year excommunication as any murder. I do believe in our Coptic church, we have no awareness, we don't talk about it. It is awful. I think I take it on myself to, we're gonna have, I'm gonna have it in the curriculum. The, the kids should know about this. They, they are treated like murderers. Anyone who does that, without a, a legitimate cause, without really a threat to the life of the mother, when we have to make a choice, either the, girl, the, 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 the mother or the baby. But otherwise, it's a murder. By all, uh, we have couples who have enough children and they're getting one that they don't want. So they go to the doctor and this is awful. This is unacceptable by all means. You know, who said that you, uh, can control the life of a human being because it's inconvenient, inconvenient to you. So this is important. We need to raise that alarm. As doctors, yes, definitely, and stand very firm. Catholic Church is doing a much better job. There's a, there's a the website, I wish that we all can get it. I do this, this is a, a scare tactic. When, I, one day I did this in the church. I brought their photos. They have a, a collection, a very big album, album of different aborted kids. Have you seen that? You, we need to see it. It's a, a life-changing experience. They have different stages of aborted babies. One in the four weeks, one in the six weeks, one in 10 weeks, one in the first trimester. And you see it from the first, early first trimester, two weeks, maybe four weeks, the baby has hands and feet and head and eyes and everything. So when you bring that to the attention of the, they, they say this, this is ex extremely important that you think about this mentality of human beings. They tell you, just an example, when America went and bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima in World War II, the reason why it was easy to do, because nobody saw the effects. It's these monsters that live over the ocean on the other side that we don't know how they look and how they think, but they are evil 
and all what we need to do now is to get rid of them. But then when they showed the movies, there was a breakdown in the mentality of the group, of the people, the society, that saw what happened. Because they found there are human beings, like mothers and children, parents, people have work and have life exactly like them, but they were devastated for generations. Once you saw the effect of what we're doing, the same thing for babies. Babies are inside the mother. It's that enemy that they need to get rid of. But did you see his face? Some states, and I think in the West House, mandate that the mother see the ultrasound, the sonography of the baby before they make a decision, which is good. Because the mother doesn't see what she's doing. So it's important. I actually need to do this. I did this for the church, and then there was a, a woman uh, one time, a woman who was very obstinate, told her, she said, I'm not going to get this baby. What reasons? Do you tell me I have like 5% risk to have a, a Down syndrome? I said, but that's not uncommon. Everybody above 30 years old have 35, have a, a, a chance, even younger. <coughs> Don't do it. She, uh, she didn't answer. And her husband said, no, she's determined. And I am not agreeing with her. She went and did it. Then I got her and one other. She didn't know that I was doing it. It was a, a meeting after she did it. A meeting and we got, because sooner or later she's going to have it. She's going to have that feeling. And I got her and then we had the uh, slides and we showed the, and she broke down. But good because we had her in counseling and we had to, what I'm trying to say is wrong is wrong and right is right. And we have to face it. We have to face that, con that the consequences of what we do. And if, if uh, people are going to make the wrong decision, at least I have done my part. Problem is, community, the society that we live in, is pushing in the other direction. They're fighting us. They're not on your side. They will never be. So be careful. And that's why the, uh, but I don't want to be, that's what, that's what I think is important too. I don't want to be a fanatic. You have to say the truth lovingly and stand by it. You have to stand by the truth. Again, ethics is not sentimental, unfortunately, but it brings the fruits. You go with sentimentality even in medicine. That's why they tell you not to treat your own family. Why? You're not going to do a good job. You're never going to be able to go do a good job because it will be very sentimental. It's like close home. You cannot do it. You cannot uh, diagnose cancer or end stage diseases or uh, operate. You cannot operate on that. It's ethically not right to operate on your own family members because you're not going to do a good job. <coughs> That's it. I have that. I, I just give you the two stories I have. Any questions? Yes. <coughs> There are few trials <coughs> from Orthodox churches, but not specifically our church. I know there is a few articles on the LA diocese. It's actually one of the few that has articles on bioethics. Just because it happened that uh, Ambassador Rabin is a, a doctor too. So he was interested. He wrote a couple of articles. <coughs> Useful. I went and researched all the, the current church Protestant and Catholic and Lutheran and Episcopalian. Uh, Episcopalian are very active in this, but they're not, you know, uh, our way of thinking either. And they have all the statements. And uh, it's important to define uh, things like what is a vegetative state, what's brain death, and all that stuff that has to be defined very clearly. And I believe the Orthodox Church says the same thing that people say, like the brain death is uh, the time when you actually pull the plug, but you have to make sure that this is the case. Yeah, that's it. Maybe medicine is not for me. <laughs> no. No, but I am doing No, it's okay.
I know. I had I had this uh, this uh, girl who was doing uh, she was working as a, what do you call it uh, genetic counseling. There's very few programs in the states, and she came and she said there are only like that handful of centers that that, that offer that training, and only one of them is Catholic, but the rest of them is very secular and they made me sign a contract that I will be able to help any woman who is pregnant who has some kind of uh, a genetic genetically disordered child or baby that I can help her with abortion. I can actually suggest it and send her to. So this was exactly what you're talking about. It's a dilemma. This is where, how, where we, we're coming to. We're coming to an age where you're gonna have martyrs again. So if truth is inconvenient and I cannot live my moral code, um, the question is I should, uh, what's the word I want to use, yield just to preserve my career and ambition in medicine or should I try very hard to find a way, a day will come when there will be no way. We know that from the Bible. There will be no way. You know, they tell you about the Antichrist, that he would have supreme control over everybody. The, the Book of Revelation tells you about the number, that it's a symbol of super control, that nobody can do anything without him permitting it. So that will come, but it's coming. It's happening. It's, it's unfortunate. We lived in a happier time. But how are we going to deal with this? It's going to be a tough search to find a place where he can, they can accept you. There are a few places. There's Protestant and Catholic places where they can actually take you if this is training. So you, you cannot do anything with that. That's, you're, you're uh, what's the word I would say? You're gonna compromise. It's a compromise of what you believe. And I'm just talking as an honest servant who wants to give you the the truth, not as somebody who wants to please you or make you feel okay. Unfortunately, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say if, if there's no way out, if there's no way out, there are centers who are Catholic, church, Catholic uh, hospitals still exist. I think I, in Massachusetts we have a couple, we had a couple of them. In, uh, in Iowa where I worked, I worked with the Mercy System, the Mercy Hospital System, but it was Catholic founded on Catholic uh, belief, and they would not allow that. And especially in the rural area in the, in the Midwest and the, in the South, I, don't, I think this, you will still find uh, the moral code intact, I'm hoping. <laughs> like, we go to metropolitan areas like New York, uh, Los Angeles, and Washington, and, and Philadelphia, and all these big cities. Of course, you will not have a chance. But most of them have the prestigious names. So it is almost like you have to compromise something for something. And the choices are always ours. You don't need to go to the big names. That's what I would say. But there's definitely in the South, there's a lot of good places. I can't, I can't tell you that, you know, it's, there's still traditional Christians in a Protestant sense who would care a lot about that issue. Okay, thank you. Don't, don't.